Hello and a very warm welcome. Just where does Britain stand? Not only on Brexit, but in the eyes of the world on pretty much everything. Is it a laughing stock of a once global power or does it still have a role to play? And if so, what role? Watching Roundtable with me, David Foster. What wonderful timing in the week that the Laurel and Hardy movie has been released. The British people may well be wondering just how they ended up in such a fine mess. Proper slapstick, perhaps, or a pie in the face. In other words, just desserts. Brexit was meant to be about taking back control. The Leave campaign saw the UK becoming a stronger, more powerful force without the EU holding it back. But business chiefs are worried about the impact of leaving the bloc without a deal, threatening the UK's place as the world's fifth largest economy. A report by Ernst & Young, states banks and other financial companies have moved at least $1 trillion worth of assets out of the country. With less than three months until Britain is supposed to leave the EU, Parliament still can't agree. How will this affect Britain's standing in the world? Well, it should be a very fascinating, lively discussion. Let's get it started. Joining us from Lancaster, I'm pleased to say we have Professor Mark Garnett, Senior Lecturer in Politics and Co-Author of British Foreign Policy since 1945. With me in the studio, Lee Rotherham, Political Advisor. Ben Laker, Professor at Henley Business School and Government Advisor, and Sir Stephen Walls, former Ambassador to the European Union, among other posts. Stephen, thank you very much, each and every one of you, for, uh, for joining us. Mark Garnett, let me come to you first of all. Author of British Foreign Policy since 1945, currently a laughing stock in the eyes of the world, or, or a country admired for its independent mindedness. Well, I think those who think seriously about what's going on at the moment will, uh, I think, revert back to 1962 when the American statesman Dean Asherson said that Britain had lost an empire and he'd yet to find a role. Uh, 56 years later, it seems that those remarks are just as appropriate as ever. I think that those who uh, think seriously about this issue will suggest that, uh, that, that Britain is in a, a kind of a state of a, a, an identity crisis almost. And I think that the main problem that we're facing is that through all these years, we haven't had a very serious discussion. This kind of programme should have been compulsory viewing for British people over that period, because it seems that a lot of things have happened to Britain, uh, and yet there's never been any assessment or real serious attempt to assess our, our place in the world. There's just been an assumption that Britain has remained the kind of power it was before the Second World War. And what people, I think, have, really need to recognise in Britain is that our country lost most out of the Second World War precisely because it did have, in terms of its global status, it had the most to lose. I think the debate over Brexit has been conducted in a way which outside observers would not be impressed by because I think a lot of it has just simply been missing the point about what Britain now is and what its role is in the world. OK, Lee, um, you, you admit that Britain is no longer, I think, a superpower, but you well, believe it is still a global power. Yes, it is. Um, I think, uh, firstly, I agree with uh, what's just been said, in particular with respect to the decline of the UK over the last 70-odd years. It is the nature of nations to rise and to fall. So it's not surprising that we should be uh, in a state of, of decline uh, comparative to other, other countries. And, that, and that's not something that necessarily to be terrified at. It's something which actually can be cathartic uh, because it allows you to revisit what your values are and where your own position is and what, you should, what your uh, role is in the world. So I, I, I'm not terrified by, by, by Brexit. I see it in a world which is a uh, a, uh, a changing world, a world where the OODA loop of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, in, in intervention and, and activism globally is, is, is speeding up. The ability to have that, uh, that direct democracy and that direct linkage and the, the quicker uh, decision-making process is actually a, a good thing. So I'm not terrified. Uh, I, I find Brexit is a, a positive. I, um, I do believe that uh, the UK has a, a significant role globally to play. It doesn't need to be a Victorian uh, s uh, s uh, scale of, of things in order to have a positive benefit for, 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 for world affairs. I think, I think what you're trying to say is that Britain is still a country that won't allow itself to be pushed around and that the world should admire it for that and that's 
basically what's happening with Brexit. I think ultimately it's not for Britain to decide. It's for other nations to decide its place and other businesses and organisations, they will choose to trade with our organisations or not. And actually if we put things in place through political paralysis, through economic decisions, through trade barriers, whatever that may be, regardless of whether you agree with uh, the Brexit outcome or not, if we make it harder for our businesses to trade either within the EU or outside it, then businesses and organisations around the world will think it's too difficult, we'll move on. We'll very, very else. hard to, to quantify this, but do you think the outside world looks at Britain and says, as I mentioned at the beginning, this country is becoming or is a laughing stock, or that it should be admired for what it's doing? I'll come to you, Stephen, in just a moment to answer the same question. But ben, I think it's a spread. And actually, if you, if you take a poll, if you look at some of the... The, the Russian line on this is it's very admirable, what we're doing, and, of course, that takes the... Uh, takes the bylines and it takes the column inches away from uh, Russian politics. If you look at uh, what's happening in France, from their perspective, the UK was never truly interested in a, in a marriage of convenience within the European Union. So actually, from their perspective, it's, it's the right outcome. But then there are, of course, nations like Germany, from their perspective, and we have, uh, we have a lot of trade with Germany, and they are mortified at what's happening here. And particularly within their car industry, they're very concerned and very worried. And, they see it, if we are rejecting the European project, we are also rejecting them too. And they will take that very personally. You see, one of the things I was interested in, earlier this week I did a programme about the number of people coming back to sort of pay homage, if you like, at the court of President Assad in Syria now that it looks like he's going to win. And the fact is, if it is to your benefit as a nation, you will remain friends, if you like, with that nation. And this is what I think is probably going to happen uh, with trade with the European Union and the rest of the world. Britain's either worth it or it isn't worth it. But what about Britain's standing, Steve? Well, I I mean, you, you had a unique perspective on this as a European Union ambassador. Well, I think coming, coming back to the point that Mark made uh, at the beginning, I mean, we, when we joined the European community, as it was in 1973, the decision that was taken, first of all, by, by Macmillan and then by Wilson and then by Heath, to apply to join, it was what, what you might call a distress purchase, like buying tyres for your car. You don't want to do it. But we concluded that in a world of two superpowers, we were no longer a superpower, and it took us quite a long time to come to that conclusion, since we still had the empire at the end of, of World War II. And to our surprise, the European community prospered to a greater extent than, than we were. And as Mark said, we never quite came to, uh, to terms with that. But what we're now in is, is uh, our large, still our largest market and a vehicle for influence because the European Union is the world's largest trading bloc, it's the world's largest aid donor and we have a very large number of trade deals across the world. So to take yourself away from that, uh, obviously, is it going to be a diminution uh, of what you've got. Now whether you can rebuild that is a very open question. My own view is it, it, it will take a long time uh, to do so. And I think your other point is, is, is right. Other countries on the whole are not obsessed by this. Their interest is what does this mean for us? Yes. And insofar as it damages them, they're interested. Otherwise, I'm not sure they, they take a view. They're perplexed, I think. I don't think they come to the conclusion that we're a basket case, or they're just, they're just perplexed. Well, see, this, this, is, this is going back to the point you made, Ben, that, that perhaps Germany is, is really worried about this, not because of the trade, per se, but because it sees itself central to the European project and it's worried that, of course, there will be a domino effect if Britain manages to get out on reasonable terms and other countries might, might think they, they could do the same. It's not necessarily about trade. It, it's, a, it's pragmatic, isn't it? Yeah, it, yes, it is, it, it, it is pragmatic. I think, I think uh, beyond that, there, is a, there has been a dynamic in the European Union, and we don't yet know what the effect of our departure will be. Part of that dynamic was that we were welcomed in by the smaller countries who, who were worried about dominance of France and Germany. That dominance obviously is diminished in the European Union of 27, uh, of 27 other countries. I mean, if you take just one example of, of the British role, which is, which is particularly relevant uh, to Turkey, without, whether you think it's right or wrong, but without the pressure brought to bear by the Blair government, negotiations with Turkey for entry into the European Union would never have opened. Fr France and Germany were, were opposed, but Britain's influence changed that, uh, that uh, dynamic. And obviously, if we're out, then that voice effectively disappears. Please, let anybody chip in at any, any one time. But, Mark, I'll come back to you just because it's a circular argument at, at the moment. But um, in terms of our contribution um, as a, a power or a, 
a supposed power in the world. Um, third as a percentage of GDP in terms of contributions to NATO, second in terms of the actual money it gives to NATO, fifth or sixth biggest economy depending on, on how you measure it, um, leader of 50 plus Commonwealth countries, it still has clout Britain, does it not? Oh, well, most certainly it does. However, I think that a lot of the discussion about Britain's role in the world is presented in that kind of statistical form. You would say that perhaps these are old-fashioned ways of measuring power. I think Britain's real power in the world is what's known as soft power. In other words, that it has a reputation. In some areas, of course, that's a very mixed reputation. But all the time we've actually been depending on this, at least in part for our role in the world, without ever really making the most of it. So, for example, whenever there are cuts in the Foreign Office, it tends to be those vehicles of soft power, uh, things like um, the BBC World Service being cut and uh, the British Council coming under... It's things like that. In other words, Britain perhaps is even stronger than its leaders realise. I think a lot of the British leaders since the war have had a kind of a, a bit of insecurity and a bit of fear that they'll be exposed for not being as powerful as we were when Neville Chamberlain flew to Munich. Now, it's true that we're not as powerful as that, but our power, our role, our influence could still be appreciable, could still be significant, if only we'd realise where the source of that power really lay. And I think a lot of our attempts to act as if we'd been a great power have in fact lost as friends or at least jeopardised our relationships across the world. This is why my main plea would be we need more reassessment, we need more honesty. Our politicians have failed us so badly in not squaring up to the facts of the situation Governments always claim that Britain under our uh, control has become great again. Oppositions always say Britain could be great, but this present government is making us weak. That sort of rhetoric has done us no good. The British public has every reason to be confused about Britain's role in the world, but that means politicians have all the more reason to try and do something to dissipate that confusion, and they palpably haven't done. And Brexit, I would argue, is at least in part the product of their that misgovernment over the last 60, 70 years. Well, perhaps no coincidence you should talk about one British leader go going to the middle of Europe, uh, coming back waving a piece of paper, albeit sort of 70-plus years ago, and another one coming back in the last six months or so waving a piece of paper saying this is what we need to do. Uh, but soft power, this is fascinating, isn't it? I mean, I came up with some stats here. How would you define Britain's soft power, Stephen, first? Well, I think... Uh, some You've seen it first yeah, yeah. Well, some of the things that, that, you, that Mark has just mentioned are absolutely, are absolutely right. But I think there's more... To, I think there's, uh, it isn't just about soft power. I think if we come out of the European Union uh, and have to kind of reinvent, if, if you like, where our place is in the world, uh, our biggest uh, assets, apart from our um, economic strength, if we can, if we can preserve it or, re or reconstruct it, are as a permanent member of the Security Council and, above all, as an important member of NATO. And I don't think, as a country, if we want to exercise weight in the world, we can avoid the question of defence spending and, I would say, increasing our defence spending. I mean, we are at a very, I think, I think even more important than Brexit. We are at a real, I think, very dangerous point in the world where you have a United States president who actually wants to dismantle all the post-war Western institutions on which we have relied. You have a China which is creating rival institutions and doing it very successfully. And you could get to the end of the Trump era and find that actually China is, in, in many respects, the, the top uh, world power. And hard power in terms of defence, if we want to keep the Americans on side, we in Europe and, uh, have, to, have to do more, the members of NATO have to do more. And I think although it would be painful for us because we haven't got the, that much money, I think Britain would have to step up more in defence terms if we're going to maintain the relationship with the United States, which I still think is, is, is crucial to our national interest. It's, it's crucial on so many different levels as well because the US uh, militarily has the capability that the EU uh, and, in fact, other states simply do not have. So, I mean, this was evidenced in the, in the Libya campaign where US support um, uh, beyond the horizon was, was critical to, to US and French uh, success in, the, in, in supporting uh, the, the people who are, who are trying to uh, uh, sort out uh, Libya. So I think that's very important. If, if, if soft power alone was uh, a, a marker for, for grand success, then then the EU itself, of course, would be a, a, a clear-cut Global superpower. Well, define soft because, power in, well, in these uh, well, terms. This is in interesting your, in your term. because of it, so many different aspects of this which combine, and some countries do well in some areas, and some countries don't. So it's, it's things like 
um, the, the the commonality of the English language, for instance, as opposed to uh, I mean, uh, uh, as opposed to to, 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 to Germany, the, the trust in the legal system and uh, a common law system, which is which which is which is global and which actually attracts people to come to the UK courts to act as as, as arbiters and, and to use in, in English law as as a matter of trust. The, uh, the 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 presence and the experience and the um, uh, the the quality of the the, the foreign office and of course the, uh, uh, the the culture is a massively important thing actually having people who like to watch um, a particular football club and uh, is uh, uh, builds a, a degree of personal connectivity between the individual music and the music is another is another one a big one no. these all add up but one other thing as well I completely agree on the on the on the defense side of things because we have scraped along um, chancing it on 2% of GDP, you basic, and, and, and stretching how you interpret that in order to achieve that now. Unless we go to John, uh, Lieutenant General Jonathan Riley, who's a retired uh, general, wrote a paper uh, looking at this and came to the conclusion that ultimately we need to be a, a proper safeguard, an investment policy, it needs to be 3%. If you have a build-up over time, you can then plan in order to know exactly what capabilities which you've lost because you've gone down to 2% So then to you build back up. up. Your, your, the, the voice you think you have on the world stage if you, if you increase your military spending. But Stephen mentioned um, the United Nations Security Council. This was something I was going to bring up to closer to the end of the programme, but since it's been mentioned, uh, five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council, which there have been since uh, the end of the Second World War, Britain, one of them. Does it deserve its place as one of the five permanent members? Is it in danger of losing it at any time, given the way the world's looking at this country now? Well, quite possibly, but, but I would define soft power just, just... Do come back to my point. ...slightly differently, and I think, look at it like this. A couple of years ago, this country, with all its positions on all its bodies, tried to host the World Cup. So did Qatar, and Qatar won. So to me, that's soft power. And why did Qatar win? It's because it's one of the world's trading posts. So for me, I would be less concerned with how traditionally you seek to build There are different soft arguments power. about why and, and certain allegations. Well. Yeah. Well, we'll right. go into that. <laughs> the, the, the point being, I don't think it necessarily matters about military spend and being part of certain committees. I think if we become an international trading hub, reduce corporation tax, become the go-to place for business, we will have true soft power because everyone will want to trade with us. So is your, is, is your position that um, it doesn't matter how much people like you, it's whether you're useful or not? Yeah, I don't like my wife, but she's useful. And we have a fantastic marriage. And the point being, <laughs> this, is my, this is my point. You well, don't you did have until like this programme. <laughs> no, no, my, the point being, <laughs> liking someone, that's not enough. You can have fantastic partnerships with people you don't like. And they are some of the most successful partnerships because you recognise what the added benefits are of a unity. You recognise that this is a true So, so we have to up our game as a country if we're going to remain useful as well as well, like. But, but you, you don't, have, you don't have to marry offer. someone you don't like. I mean, to stretch the narrative. No, this is, this is for a different <laughs> programme. We will come back to that one. <laughs> yeah. Stephen, per Ruth. Permanent <laughs> Five, as a former ambassador, does Britain deserve its place still on the United Nations Security Council? And perhaps more important, is it going to manage to keep it? Uh, thereby yes. be an influence. In yes and yes, I would say. I mean, uh, I think we, I, I'll come back to why we deserve it. I think we'll keep it because it's actually very, it's very al almost impossible to get change unless we agree to that change. I mean, there was a report commissioned by Kofi Annan when he was Secretary General, which rightly recommended that India, for example, should be on the Security Council, but uh, that none of that report really, really happened. But I think from looking at it, if you, if you, if you believe that there are such a thing as the kind of values which, on the whole, the West, broadly speaking, represents having France and Britain as permanent members of the. Security Security Council, when Russia and China are there representing a different set of, uh, of values and interests, is very important. And we are a very active uh, member of the Security Council and a responsible member of the Security Council. Uh, and I think in our own interest, and I would say the broader uh, interest of what you might call liberal Western values, it's important that we remain there. Okay. Um, you've written a history of Britain and the European Union. Um, going up to, I think, about 1985. Five, 1985. Yeah. Would you say the last, 
uh, what, 23 years or whatever it is, uh, 33 years, have been more interesting than anything that's gone before. Well, uh, that's, I mean, the, the, if, you look, if you look at the Thatcher period, that was, that was extremely inter inter interesting because she took on the European community as then was over the issue of Britain's budget contribution and fought a great battle, which she, uh, which she won. I think what did happen, though, particularly within the uh, Conservative uh, Party when Margaret Thatcher lost power and sat on the back benches of the House of Lords in opposition to the Maastricht Treaty negotiated by her successor, John Major, uh, was that a number of young conservatives sort of sat at her feet and hostility to the European community, European Union, and loyalty to the fallen leader became, became synonymous. And I think what was already a divide in the Conservative Party, when I worked for John Major, I, I remember saying, I can't remember now precisely what, I said to him one day, why don't you do X, Y, and Z? And he, sent, he said to me, because I am standing astride a crack in the Conservative Party, which is getting wider by the day. And that crack got wider and wider um, after Margaret Thatcher left, uh, left office. And but, I think, but I mean- So, so I, I suppose the question that follows that, bear, bear with me, mm. is that if it's because of a schism in the Conservative Party, and we know that that's probably why David Cameron called the referendum in the first place, is it the fault of Britain per se that we're in this position, or is it the fault of just one or two politicians? Well, it's always been a divide. I mean, it's nearly always been a divisive issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, t Harold Wilson had to... Uh, offer a referendum on whether we should stay in the European community to only two years after we joined because of splits within the Labour Party and those splits reopened within weeks if not mu or months uh, of the referendum result even though the referendum result was pretty decisive in terms of of, uh, of staying in and the Labour Party in the early 1980s was a party that wanted to come out of the of the European uh, community that that for various reasons sort of that the shifted uh, towards the, co the Conservative Party but it does it does reflect this basic uh, point I think about uh, not actually ever perhaps coming to terms with what kind of country the Dean Atchison point that Mark made quite what kind of country we want to be and what our place in the in the world is we've 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 wrestled with it and the conception of the European community European uh, Union with supranational institutions and, the, and a sort of federal concept at the heart of it was always very very difficult for us it's why uh, the government the post-war governments of Attlee and then Churchill and, and and Eden didn't want any part of it even though when Churchill talked about the United States of Europe, he meant the continent of Europe, not, uh, not Britain. But of course it's very interesting, Hugo Jung, um, his, his book The Blessed Plot, made the, uh, made, made, made the observation that there was a fundamental uh, flaw in the whole project from a UK perspective, which was it was on sole and false pretenses, as it were. Now you can argue the extent to which, uh, back in the 70s, the, you know, the, the, the long-term uh, vision was was set out in terms of whether the EU would develop, but it's certainly the case that you have we've had two generations of politicians and members of the public who've watched what's going on, and you've had single European Act, Maastricht, Lisbon Treaty, uh, 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 um, Amsterdam Treaty, Nice, uh, 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 the failed EU Constitution, Lisbon Treaty, and so on and so forth. There's a process. And it's difficult to buy into a process unless you've got a clear idea as to what you actually, what the end product is going to be. Can, can, can I throw this one mm. out there? Because we, we are coming towards the end. It goes so rapidly. Of course. Uh, which is a good thing and a bad thing. <laughs> uh, but, Mark, can Britain rebuild itself as an international power if and when it leaves the European Union, or is that hope now gone? Well, uh, well I, I've been arguing that we really ought to reassess our place in the world. I think if Britain reassesses its place in the world, whatever it does, it's got a much better chance of being a significant power. If you have a sense of who you are and what your role is, you're in a much better position to play a worthwhile role. And does that, and does that so take if, visionaries, which we don't seem to have at the moment? I just think it takes honesty. And the only person of all these prime ministers, it's interesting, Stephen was talking about Mrs Thatcher. What happened with Mrs Thatcher was that the media and Mrs Thatcher herself were able to present our relationship with Europe as a zero-sum game. In other words, that the discussions with Europe were not about compromise, they were about who won and who lost. And that's where a relationship went sour, which was always on the wrong basis. We were never really given the rationale for going into a proper partnership where we would have to be compromising. Harold Macmillan avoided all the tough questions. And so the, these politicians, as I say, I think a lot of them have feared exposure 
that, that they've talked as if Britain was exactly as it was before the Second World War. And you can see why they did that, because, of course, Britain played a glorious part in the Second World War. But it was a ruinous part in the Second World War, and it meant that we had to wind down so much of our Financially ruinous. Role. Um, final word, but yeah. if I can throw this to you. Government advisor on this and other things. Um, I don't know whether anybody's called you up since the vote in the House of Commons. Um, but if they have, and if they were to do so, would you have advice? Useful advice? Useful advice, uh, business-related advice, and as opposed to personal life. Uh, my advice would be play for time. I think we need more time to assess, and I think the biggest issue is we are politically and economically in a state of paralysis, where actually some decisions just need to be made. And a lot of people won't like the decisions that are made, but it's better to make a decision than to continually assess and ultimately do and nothing. Mark says honesty is what's needed. Have we had not very much of that? No, no, I, th I think he makes a good point. I think brutal honesty to say to some people, this is the direction we're doing, and actually, you might not like it, but that doesn't matter. We have to have a direction of travel. I, w I wish there were more time, Lee. I, I really do. I mean, we can continue this afterwards. I hope, I hope we can do. Um, Stephen, thank you very much indeed. Um, I look forward to your next volume about um, where we are at the moment and where we might be going. Yeah, thank yeah. you very much indeed. Mark Garnett, thank you to, to both of you. Appreciate your time. Um, that is it. Uh, that is uh, the end, although I'm pretty sure it isn't. Join me next time on Roundtable. For now, thanks for your company. Goodbye. <laughs>